I love the Friday crowd because you are the uh, more dedicated students that actually show up. It's really nice to have you here. Thanks a lot. Really much appreciated. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, Verilog again. We, we saw, no, you don't like it? Okay, I'll wait. Okay, so uh, last week we covered combinational circuits and at the end we realized that we don't have to do the dirty work all ourselves. Uh, there are tools, uh, we can describe them in a hardware description language, and then that hardware description language can be used to synthesize these things into actual circuits. And uh, we will do the same. Now we covered the basics of sequential circuits. We didn't cover actually that much. We said that sequential circuits are combinational circuits plus a state holding element. And then we spent a lot of time on finite state machines. And uh, annoyingly, we defined two different types. We said that there is a Mealy one and a Moore one. And uh, a lot of books put emphasis on these things, rightfully so, because we actually care uh, if we combine two FSMs together. So if this guy is sending an output, is being received by the next uh, finite state machine, and then immediately produces an output and goes back, you could create a combinational loop. And it is very easy to see whether or not you could have a combinational loop. If any one of these is a Moore machine, it means that the outputs are generated only out of a state. So there is no possibility of a combinational loop. The only case is if both FSMs are melee type, then, and not always, then there is a possibility. Then you have to be careful because under circumstances, you could have something where you create a loop and we, we, we violate one of our principles when we are talking about combinational circuits, there is a loop, hence we have a problem. So this is why we care whether or not they are Moore and Mealy. And I still insist 100% I will ask a question about Moore and Mealy, okay? Really, I will. Now, um, I'll show you a few slides. The next slides, I can already tell you, since I'm so much into divulging this uh, secrets about what is and what is not in the exam, uh, we will, I will not ask questions from this part of the slides. Those of you watching in July, you can skip the next five minutes. <laughs> okay, so, um, but this is important, nevertheless, uh, for you to understand. So we are, not, we are not here trying to fill in the lecture with unnecessary things and, you know, it's not for you to skipping it. Uh, when you try to design finite state machines, sometimes the way you think, the way you, the way you explain things can, um, can make really a difference. Now, uh, this is not very easy. However, uh, I'll show you an example. It is in the book, and it's an interesting example that we want to modify the traffic light controller to have a parade mode. And in the parade mode, we have uh, two inputs. You enter the parade mode when you press P1, and then uh, the Bravado light will stay green, and when R is 1, it leaves the parade mode. Now, when you are trying to do this the traditional way, you can create your uh, state diagrams and you say, okay, this is my controller uh, and this is my, you know, these are my inputs. I already had TATV. Now I'm adding PNR. The lamps will be the same. Now, I will first show you what happens when you do the above one. And then the idea is instead of putting everything in one giant finite state machine, factoring them and saying, hey, here's a state machine that determines what the mode is and tells the other one will end up being much simpler. So I'm instead of putting everything into one definition, defining them as two separate problems that interact with each other, in some cases makes life easier. Now, here is the unfactored transition diagram and the yeah, Jesus, yeah, right. <laughs> and the thing that makes it complex is that parade mode could be activated at any time. You don't know when the parade mode can be activated. So while you're going through your normal progression, 
any time somebody might press the parade button. So in every state, you still have to sort of kind of figure out was the parade mode pressed or not and things like that. OK? Don't be afraid. Not in the exam. When you factor it, when you go back to this thing and say, OK, instead of making everything separate, let me make one finite state machine, which is the parade mode, and make, uh, let's make another one, which is just the, uh, the regular one that I had before, with the addition of this mode signal coming here. Let's go here and take a look. You all of a sudden see that this is my lights finite state machine. I have actually one place where I am modifying my parade mode. And I have a mode FSM, which is pretty simple. You know, this is mode is zero, so no parade mode. Once you press P, you go to the parade mode. And once you press R, you go back to the no parade mode. So designing them side by side is much simpler than trying to design this one. Now, why I'm, am I showing you this? First of all, that there is actually, uh, I mean, it's not always as trivial to come up with an FSM that is easy to make and realize. And sometimes um, also as a designer, you have difficulty, right? Because if you have to implement this, you are writing a lot of, um, uh, you are adding lots of gates. There is a possibility of making a mistake. There is so many arrows going back and forth, you might make a mistake. Simplifying it would be better for you. But our argument will be actually that instead of designing these by hand, it is much easier to let some poor synthesizer take care of it. So you can describe what you want to do. And hopefully, the synthesizer will do for you these kind of things, although compilers, synthesizers still appreciate if the code is written in a way that makes life a little bit easier for them. Now, if you want to design your FSMs, regardless whether or not you're using system Verilog or drawing everything by, your, uh, by hand, you have to first identify your inputs and outputs. That's the basic of creating your, uh, your module, your block. Then please sketch a state transition diagram so that you know what the finite state machine is going to do. What are the states? How do you move from one to another? Uh, are you a Moore machine? Are you a Mealy machine? And then from there, you can write a state transition table. You select some state encodings. If you're doing it in Verilog, this, is, this will be done for you. And for a Moore machine, we write a state transition table with the state encodings, write the output table for a Mealy machine, you have also the state transition and the output table at the same time. Write the Boolean equations, simplify it, and we are done. So this was what I still owed you from last time. Remember, we will come to this again. We have three parts for every finite state machine. Oh, no, that wasn't the right one. This one. Yeah. We have three parts of every finite state machine. We have a state holding element. So these are the D latches, D flip-flops that are holding your present state. And when the clock signal comes, they will move you from, uh, from the present state to the next state, meaning that the next state will be copied into the present state. How do you know what the next state is going to be? Easy, you are going to have some combinational logic here where you have some inputs coming from the outside, as well as the present state will go in, depending on where you are at the moment, and depending on the current inputs, you are going to decide on the next state. And what is going to happen to the output? Well, we are going to make our output based on the state, and then, uh, these guys don't see it. I wrote more here. Uh, if your output is only a function of the, of the state, you are going to have uh, what we call a Moore state machine. If you have your output from the present state and the inputs at the same time, where are the inputs? Oh. 
then you are going to have a mealy FSM. Important also in the next part of the lecture when we go to very low, have these three aspects. We have one part that holds the present state, we calculate the next state, we determine the outputs. Keep these things separate, your life will be easy. Questions? No? Okay, let's move on. And to move on, I have to go to the chat. Okay, so today, what I really wanted to talk about was Verilog for sequential circuits. We should probably make a short summary because it's not exam time yet, so we need to review some of the things. Then we will talk about how to define the sequential logic elements. And the only thing we care about are what? Yeah, <laughs> I also think it's quite funny. <laughs> no, nothing? Somebody said something. I think somebody said state holding elements, flip flops. That's correct, thank you. Now, there is some, there's going to be something very funny. We realize that with the current constructs, we cannot write uh, state holding elements because everything we knew, we, we have learned so far is only for combinational circuits. And there has to be a trick to make sure that we can also memorize things. And for that, we are going to introduce some new statements, new constructs, etc. Now, there's a side effect of these constructs because these new constructs can be used to this, are needed to make sequential logic, but you can also misuse them for, uh, for, for combinational circuits. And some of you are going to say, wow, really, this is really, really nice. And then once we know these tricks, we are going to go back to the finite state machines, which means that we are going to learn how we can define a state holding element, calculate next state, and calculate the output, this time uh, using only very low code. So let's go. Here's a short summary. We all know this. Who has not used Verilog so far? OK. Exercises? You also, OK. Very short summary. Verilog is cons consists of modules. So what we want to design in, it will be designed in a module. And actually, what we are trying to do is explain uh, what this circuit does inside. But first of all, we need to describe what are its inputs, what are its outputs, and we will give it a name. And in very log speak, this happens like this. So this is the name of the module, in this case, example. We list the inputs and outputs. We tell whether or not they are inputs and outputs. So A, B, C is input, Y is output. And then we finish our module saying end module. Great. And then in between here comes the circuit description. So we can, in this case, where we define the inputs A, B, C, and Y, these end up being one bit values. One bit doesn't really express too much. It can be zero and one. What if I want to express larger numbers? Well, it's easy. We can define collections of them, arrays of them. We call them buses. So in this case, uh, the B2 output is actually eight bits. Uh, it has components B7, B6, B5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. You can still mix and match them. You can have one bit inputs, multiple bit inputs, etc. Now, the interesting thing is to manage complexity, we can create a hierarchy. We call this a structural uh, hardware description uh, mode. So here I have a small module two inputs A, B, one output Y. So this is a small person. I don't really care what's inside of small at the moment. Some, at some point, somebody has designed it. I know I want to use it. I know that I want to put two of them together. And so this is a top module, which has two instances of small. The first instance is here. The second instance, this one, is here. We also realize some of those peculiarities of Verilog. Uh, there are many different ways of writing things. In this case, for example, this instantiation goes A, S, E, L, N, 1, meaning that this signal A, which belongs to the module top, will be connected to 
the pin A, uh, <laughs> that one, okay? And the second one, cell, will be connected to B, and the output will be connected to N1. This is really dangerous. Don't do this. Uh, we are explaining this because you might go on the internet, look for examples. It's a perfectly valid way of writing Verilog. It is not very practical because it entirely depends on the order of declaration here. If somebody comes and makes a change, remember, it's not always you who's doing the design. You might be working on a large team on, on a, you know, with your lab partner or with a much, much larger team. Usually processor designs are done in teams of hundreds over two, three years of time. And if somebody decides to make a change, well, you are going to have a strange connection. Then we said we can have simple logic operations and or XOR inversion. So this one ends up being an AND, right? A and B not. And the operations can be on single bits, or in this case, we have declared a four-bit bus for all these inputs and outputs. So actually, there is four XORs here parallel. So A3 is being XORed with B3 and written to Y3, 3. Silence. Then, for some reason, the, the um, the circuit that I'm obsessed with, multiplexer, it uses what we call a ternary operand. So we are making an assignment to the output conditional on S. If it is one, this uh, part gets assigned to Y. Otherwise, the zero gets assigned. I mean, if you were to think of it in terms of computing, you would say if S, then Y is D1, else Y is D0. This one is going to be very popular. We are, we are going to use it a lot because a lot of times in a processor, in a digital system, we will have to make a choice. Either I am taking uh, this part of the, uh, of the signals or the other part of the signals. We use multiplexers a lot. That's why I say I like them. It's not like I really like them. I'm just... There is also a strange way of expressing numbers. So we start with N that always says how many bits are needed. So this is always in number of bits. Uh, in, the, in this example, we are talking about the eight bit number. Next comes the base. Although I express the number in bits, the number can be expressed in some format that you are more familiar with, happy with. So this could be uh, binary could be hexadecimal or decimal. If you're really into this, it can also be octal. Anybody remember what octal was? Great. Who wants to? No, OK. And then we define the number. The good news is we can put underscores in between them uh, so that if we have a long sequence of numbers, you know, counting whether or not we have 11 zeros or 10 zeros is a little bit easier. And there were a number of examples here. We are not going through them. Maybe one thing to note is we also had these, we had zeros and ones. We also had these strange things, X and Z. Uh, that can also be expressed as part of the numbers like normally. Then we had the precedence of operations. Notice that inversion has the highest precedence and the ternary operation comes last. Uh, I hear that this is, this is one of the popular questions on the internet circulating, that people don't know presence of operations. OK. Any questions so far for the? Yeah, sorry. Uh, when you have um, with the numbers, when you have uh, Yeah. So if you. Let's do this. 4HX will be X, 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 4X is in binary. It's a bit, I mean, what is difficult when you say H and X is trying to make sure that, I mean, trying to assign this 0X, 1, 0, that's not going to work. Yes? Uh, slide eight. Yes. 
Oh, <laughs> so it's an excellent question. Maybe I didn't understand the question right, but what I understood is an excellent one. So always say that was the question. So if y is not a bus, but uh, d0 and d1 is still a bus, would that be? OK, so this is a great question. And it is sort of cool and annoying depending on your stance. Verilog is not a strongly typed language. He will not complain that the left-hand side of the equation and right-hand side of the equation do not have the same number of bits. He will just say, oh, OK, I mean, he knows what he's doing. In this case, not that I'm a, you know, I, I know the language reference manual by heart, but I would say why, since it's one bit, would be uh, taking D10 or D0, zero, meaning the least significant bits of them. Uh, so sometimes uh, people use this kind of trickery to their advantage. You know, they say, ah, OK, this is going to do this. It's very, very annoying, right? I mean, uh, you, you have some meta thinking behind you're not saying it. It would have been much nicer to maybe assign a single bit versions and then make this and make it explicit that you really care about. I mean, you could have written here D10 and D00. You're just being, how shall I say, a not nice person in writing it this way and hoping uh, and, and, and asking the compiler, the synthesizer, to take care of it. Um, so please don't do it. Because it's very difficult to differentiate between whether or not you really wanted to do this or you simply made a mistake. And someone else, not you, going through your code may be ticked off because of this and say, hey, hey, alarm, alarm, there's something wrong going on. Make sense? Yes. I'll do that in the break. Because we went through X and Z for a while. It takes a bit longer. I'm not trying to get out of it. But let's talk about the sequential circuits. Is that OK? I did it twice in two in consecutive days. <laughs> I said I'm not answering the question. Evil Frank. Sorry. OK, so let's get to sequential logic. Are we excited? We want to see memories. How are they done? It will be awful. Uh, we want to define flip-flops, latches, and then finite state machines. Because if we can do this, everything is open. We are designing everything we want. Now, the first thing is, uh, remember that we had this special signal. The clock signal was telling us when we were moving from the, uh, from the current state to the next state. And the flip-flops were these magical elements. And we were talking about rising edge triggered flip-flops. Remember those? And the rising edge triggered flip-flops were working based on a clock signal. And when that clock signal was changing, rising from 0 to 1, in that small instance, they were looking at their input, which is D, and capturing whatever is here and copying it to their output. And they only do this in the small time frame where that clock signal is going from 0 to 1. This part, the going from 0 to 1, gives it the rising H triggered. And this is a flip-flop. And it's a D-type flip-flop, whatever. So that was our main building block that we wanted to create. And these are triggered by a clock event. Now, we also saw there are latches. And latches were sensitive to the level of the signal. So not on the edge, but the entire time the clock is either 1 or 0, they would be transparent or they would be storing. Flip-flops are sensitive to the transitioning edge of the clock. And we said we liked it a lot. And for the duration of the lecture, we want to keep it this way. Once you are more experienced, you will also ask question, why only the rising edge? What about the falling edge? Equal edges. We want everything. And then you will design more complex circuits. Now, we need new constructs because conditional, uh, combinational constructs are not sufficient. So we are, this week, we are going to talk about always. Now, 
always has a cousin called initial that is going, we are going to talk about initial uh, next week. This week, it's all, all about always. Now, always, <laughs> this is going, now, one of two things is going to happen. Either I'm going to manage to explain this properly and everybody will be happy, or I'm going to make a mess out of it. We will see in an hour. <laughs> okay. So the always statement starts with that funny at sign. And then there is a sensitivity list. We are going to come and describe all of them. And whenever the event in the sensitivity list occurs, the, the next statement will be, uh, I mean, will be uh, active. We will execute it. We are not really, it's not a program, so we are not really executing statements. But the uh, compiler will understand that we are doing something, we are defining something that happens in this thing. So let's not talk too much. Let's just quickly make a detail flip-flop, this one here. And it looks like this. We say always. Now comes the bold ones are uh, you know, specific to the language. So post edge uh, defines a rising edge. They define it as a positive edge. Uh, the opposite would be neg edge. At post edge clock, D is going to be copied to, to Q. I mean, it even sort of makes sense, right? Always, when you see a post edge, copy D to Q. Right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, the post edge defines a rising edge. It's a transition from zero to one. The process will only trigger if the clock signal rises. This means that D is not always equal to Q. D is only going to be equal to Q the moment there is a post edge. So this is what this construct is trying to tell us. Is this good so far? Boring, boring, but good. OK. OK, now let's make life a little bit uh, difficult. First of all, let's realize that normally, if I was writing Verilog, if I wanted to assign one signal to the other one, I would go on and write assign Q equals to D. That's what I would do. I would literally write assign Q equals to D. But now we are using this strange thing. And I agree it is strange. I didn't say Verilog was very logical. I'm just explaining what it is. Now, this describes a non-blocking assignment. And boy, you will have questions about that. You are right. It doesn't matter actually so much. We will see the difference between blocking assignments and non-blocking assignments in a while, hopefully. There is another big difference, and it sort of got lost in the background. Instead of defining this just an input or an output, the signal that I was assigning to was, had an additional part. It said rec. What does rec sound like? It's written there, right? Oh. <laughs> Register, yes. Uh, this is one of the problems with Verilog. You, for registers, you will need to define them as rec, but it doesn't mean that everything that's defined as rec will be a register. Yeah, I know. Anything that is assigned to in an always statement has to be defined as rec. And we use always statements to define flip-flops, latches, registers, that is correct. But we might also use always blocks for other things. And when we do that, we still have to define those signals, wires as rec. Yes. Excellent question. Super excellent question. Now, notice that I just wrote always and then one statement. I even indented it a little bit, Python style. 
Um, Technically speaking, I should have had a block, a begin and block, and written. And when I have a begin and block, I can write as many statements as I want. So uh, you could have five different things being assigned inside this thing. However, if you write it one after another, it won't work. Uh, if you want to have multiple statements, I have an example at the very end. We should put a begin and block, and everything uh, between the begin and end will come as one unit. Very, very good question. I love the questions. Okay, remember that our flip-flops have some issue. They can store, they can store some value and they have two stable outputs. The outputs could be zero, they could be one. So when I turn on the circuit, what will they be? We discussed that we don't really know it. It will be zero or one. It will not be like 0 0.75, okay? It will always be a zero or one. We just don't know what it is. That's the definition of X, by the way. And uh, so what we want to do, uh, we want to maybe have a reset that allows us at the very beginning of the operation to, to put a value to our flip-flop. Traditionally, reset is something that will set the value to zero. So right now, our example has this integrated. It's a D-type flip-flop with an asynchronous reset. And uh, you'll notice this is great for asking exam questions because tiny, tiny changes completely change the story. Now we have always, we are looking at positive edge of the clock and negative edge of reset, whichever. Okay. We begin. So this is the part that I was telling you about. It was put in a block because I want to define something slightly longer. And we go. First of all, rejoice. There's an if inside always. Who likes if statements? Great. You're going to love always because if you want to use if in Verilog, always. Okay, so if reset is equal to zero, then let's make sure that the Q is going to get the value zero. Else, well, what happens when else? It means that reset didn't trigger. It was something else that was happening. What's the other thing where we would have triggered? It's the positive edge of the clock. This means that, hey, it wasn't clock that was happening. It wasn't reset that was happening. It was clock. So this means that I should copy D to Q. The ordering of how I write it gives reset the preference, right? So anytime, regardless of the clock, if reset is zero, our output will be zero. If there is no reset, then, well, we'll wait until the rising edge of the clock, and then we are going to copy it. There was a question coming. Yes. Yeah, well, it is, it is, um, it triggers on the negative edge, right? So it means that the uh, reset signal, uh, so the reset signal was falling. And if you want to metaphorically think about it, uh, by the time you come here, the reset ended up being zero. Uh, this, this definition really doesn't include a time. I mean, uh, we are, I mean, obviously in real life, this transition doesn't take zero time, but for, for the purposes of description, it's an instantaneous event. It's the moment where it turns zero. So it's not like halfway between, it is actually this point. And pulse H is actually this point. So it turned one and reset turned zero. Yes. We are going to come to that. Very good question, though. OK. Good. Let's make our life a little bit. Let's just explain this a little bit. The begin and end is for longer statements. Uh, in this example, actually, 
I, it wasn't necessary. Notice that always starts and there's if there's else, it was just here for explanation. But any type of longer statement, it's better to have the beginning and end. Actually, I would tell you that it's, you should always use them because what happens in frequently when you are designing, uh, when you are writing very low case, you start very simple, so you have one assignment, and then you realize, oh, maybe I can add something else. The moment you do that, uh, you start introducing errors because there wasn't a begin end. If you even for a single statement write begin end, you can just you know extend it, expand it as you want. Sorry, question. No, 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 it doesn't. Well, the if, uh, I mean, it, it, first of all, I mean, I know it's very confusing, but this is not a program that runs, okay? This is, uh, remember when we were talking about uh, hardware description languages, we said there's a behavioral description and there's a structural description. So far, we looked at structural descriptions where blocks were connected. This is a behavioral description. We are explaining what, what we, uh, we are explaining the behavior of what's happening, and the synthesizer figures out and says, ah, he wants a D flip flop. Okay, so uh, the synthesizer will start looking here only if a positive H clock or a negative H reset came. So at this point, uh, he goes actually uh, one by one, checks, was reset zero? No, okay, then it was clock. But you can enter here without reset being, I mean, it's not uh, both of them at the same time. It's either or. Yes? Uh, is there a reason you select? Yes, you can use either H you want. Uh, this has, uh, <laughs> this is actually one of the funniest stories. Traditionally, my grandfather, used to always use negative edge. And at that time, when my, it was my grandfather, when I was uh, your age, uh, there was a good reason for using negative edge, which will be very obscure if I tell you now. When FPGA started, a, and in ASIC design, almost universally people use negative edge. And when FPGA started, the things that you use in, in your exercises, uh, they were rebellious. They were saying, yeah, we can do things better than that. And they said, why should we be negative? And FPGAs traditionally work better with positive H reset. Uh, because they were asking themselves, why is it negative? We also want positive resets. And at that point, it didn't make any difference anymore. Whatever the technical reasons were, were no longer relevant. Those were relevant in 1970s they were no longer relevant in 2000s. And you will see throughout the uh, book and uh, examples, we try to also switch them around so that you, know, you don't get uh, comfortable with one. It could be either one. I love the questions. OK. So I think I moved a bit too much because I thought I was talking, yeah. <laughs> We were here, we were here. Okay. So, as I was explaining, the first reset is checked. If reset is zero, Q is set to zero. This is what we call asynchronous because it's not dependent on the clock. We can come here anytime the reset changes to zero. It can be anywhere. It's not really dependent on, on the edge of the clock. This is why we call it asynchronous. It's not synchronized to the clock. And if there is no reset, then the normal assignment is made. Now, how do I do a synchronous reset? Well, I conveniently forget the sensitivity list. Notice how evil this is. It's like, you know, let's do things synchronously. And then I don't write the sensitivity list there. It means that the only time you can come in here is if there was a reset. Otherwise, you wouldn't end up here. Logical? In most cases, in most cases, we will use 
asynchronous reset in our circuits. There's a very good reason for that. You don't want to wait for the clock. You say, hey, uh, somebody has come, press the reset button. Uh, let's clear things. Uh, this one is more like a functional description. And in most cases, instead of having a synchronous reset, you know what we will do? We will embed the synchronous reset functionality in calculation of the next state, meaning that whatever causes the reset will be an input, and then we'll say the next state is the reset state, and then the guy will take it, rather than uh, modifying the description of the state holding element, synchronous resets actually are more uh, or better defined in there. Just as a side note. Now, we also had this enable flip-flop. If you go to the sequential logic uh, blocks, you will see that we were describing it. It goes the same way. We again have a synchronous reset. That was the part. And now we have another statement. Else if enable, then D gets Q. So the funny part is the enable signal is not part of the sensitivity list. OK? It's still only sensitive to only to clock and only to reset. But once we are inside, we are checking what the value of enable is. This is very specific. This is also highly confusing. I understand. It's not me, my grandfather, or anyone in my family that wrote very long. Don't be mad with me. Now, also one tiny, tiny, tiny warning. Uh, this looks great, right? You could write the entire processor with one always begin and then put everything you need inside here. Uh, we will try to stay away from this. We will say, this code defines only the state holding element. Don't put anything else. The most you should be putting is an enable. It's a good guideline. It's not necessary. You can still design circuits by going completely apeshit here. But sticking to that convention just reduces or just increases your productivity. So take it as an advice. OK, OK, there's not much objection. So oh, 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 oh objection. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sure. So it's not like always going to be uh, executed in the beginning. But what's the initial value of Q? Uh, that's a good question. Was it the same? No, okay. Always is always going to be, always is never going to be executed, okay? We are not executing things, so it's not a program that runs. We are defining a hardware block. We are trying to say, please put this there. I mean, that's what we are literally saying. Remember when I talked about Verilog, there was this big, crazy drawing with things. That is what we are doing. We are not writing a program. It's, it's really important to, to try to get into the feeling of that. So when I write this piece of code, what I really am trying to tell him secondhand is put this in my circuit. Okay, well, in this case, there's an enable. Let, I mean, it also is an enable input. Okay? Always is always going to be active, if you want, as a definition. And uh, it will not be at the beginning of the simulation, if you want. If you are simulating this, you turn on this device, the output will be undefined. And we use x, that was the question, to, to describe this undefined value. We are going to say the output q is x until the time we do something with it. And to do something with it, because these things are all interconnected, because the output of this flip-flop will go to a combinational logic. That combinational logic may end up as the input of the next flip-flop. So there, is, there might be this like huge undefined things going all over the place. And for that, we are going to say, hey, I have this reset signal. The only reason why it's there is to create an initial state that everybody can agree on. And once you pull the reset for a little while, the circuit is going to have a defined state. In this case, it's going to be zero. In some other cases where you have, I mean, you can write whatever you want here, right? I mean, you, I mean it's reset, but it could go to one. It could go to uh, something else. 
Somebody says we should have it. Oh, yes, ask your question. Yeah, you can write a lot of different things. Please don't. If you don't write many different things, if you write a couple of known statements, you actually are going to get this. If you write something more, and if you are good at writing something more, you might get this entire thing, assuming you didn't make some funny mistakes. The, the ridiculous thing in very low case, he will not complain too much, even if you make a mistake, he will not know if you did the mistake on purpose or, uh, you know, just, just plain did a mistake. He will figure it out. Something will come out. It's a good time to take a break and go home. <laughs> uh, we continue at quarter past. What does the set mean in practice? Is the pass on the board something? I press, once I press it, sorry.
No problem. Okay, okay. Is it live? Hello. Let's get going. The sooner we start, the sooner we finish, and then we have the weekend. Yay. We can do all the studying in the weekend. OK. So I told you we are not going to use them so much. However, it would be a disservice not to briefly explain how a latch looks like. Uh, very similar, notice that in a latch, uh, the output is going to be, or uh, the, the latch is transparent, de depends on the definition, uh, when clock is high. And the description is relatively simple. We say always at clock ND, no post edge, okay? And we say if clock, then D is going to be copied to Q. I'll come back to this thing because it will explain a number of annoying things. And it looks very simple the way I explain it right now. That's deliberate. Uh, the annoying things will come in a few seconds. That keeps you awake. Yes. Uh, it's actually very logical what you say, but it, in this particular case, it doesn't work. I'm, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay? It's a good one. Very good one. Maybe I should ask in the exam. Okay. So, uh, you know, part of teaching is telling you little, little lies or telling you not the complete story so that you don't get freaked out and run away. So right now, uh, we have made some, we, we overlooked some things, okay? That was deliberate, because some of those discussions take too long, but we want to first introduce some of the uh, aspects uh, before making life complicated. So sequential statements are written in an always block. There is no other choice of making it. Whenever you want to make a sequential statement, use an always block. The sequential block is triggered with a change in the sensitivity list. We still didn't really talk about, and you know, there were some weird things, questions are also coming. Uh, we will see that there is, uh, and a lot of people are asking me, what does an always statement look like? We are doing this because we want to describe specific circuits, not generic ones for sequential statements. Although, if you really force it, you can actually define the entire FSM in, its, in just one always block. We will argue that please do it in three separate always blocks. One of them for the state holding element, one of them for the next state, and one of them to calculate the output. This is why I'm stressing it so much. Um, signals assigned with an always must be declared as rec. This is one of the most annoying things ever. Um, now, when you are looking, remember we were talking about there's an older version of the book and the newer version of the book. Who remembers that? Who has the newer version of the book? Or who is following the newer version of the book? Okay, so in the newer version of the book, most examples are written in system Verilog. System Verilog includes the entire Verilog statements. However, some of the, let's say, more obscure parts of Verilog have been cleaned out. So that one of the things that disappeared was this rec one. So everybody realizes this is kind of annoying. You can live with it. Uh, so please live with it. And let me ask questions about that. OK. Now we have this strange assignment for non-blocking assignments. And we do not use a sign within the uh, always block. Now let's, let's slowly get a little bit uh, complicated. We can have as many always blocks as we want in parallel. They remember that when we are making, writing this code, we are not writing a program. 
It's not like first I run this, then I run this, then I run this. What I'm doing is I'm drawing a schematic. They exist in parallel next to each other. This also means that the way I order them has no difference. I can write first this one, then this one, then this one, or any other order. They do not, that's not a program that runs. It's a statement of fact. It says that here be a flip-flop, here be a combinational circuit, here be a latch, okay? Very silence. Okay. Now, the assignments of signals inside the always block and outside the always block are different. I'm like 50 plus years old. I still don't know why this is the case. Uh, they first started making it this way. And once they had to introduce the always blocks, maybe they said, I don't need it anymore. I have no idea. It is one of those strange things that, you know, comes and lives in, uh, in, uh, in Verilog. Now, one thing, uh, one thing that you have to be careful, I believe I have another slide for it, but let me uh, say it again. It's really, really important that uh, assignments be made to a signal only through one place. So if I'm assigning special in this always block, I should never have an assign statement to special here or here. Why is that? I mean, it's very logical, actually. Anyone? I'm looking for a board. Yeah, this one. Any ideas? Yes? Yes, so the, the, the thing is, every statement that you write is driving, is driving the output of a signal. In this case, I have special. I have another one that is, uh, what do I have, Q? And I have, oh, I have special Q and normal, oh my God. Who gave these names? So this is, uh, if you want, statement number one. This is number two. This is number three. And they define how the signal is being driven. Give me a sec. Now, if I had special assigned both here and here, what I would create is, so if this guy was also trying to define special, exam question, what is this? Is it a combinational circuit? No. We are creating a circuit that we are not covering in digital circuits so far. We are actually creating a conflict between this statement and this statement. They might agree at times, they might disagree at times. So we don't know what the result will be. And then we are going to say, hey, I don't know what it is. I don't know which one of these statements will be stronger. So it is important the moment that you are writing this, you are actually on a copper wire. You are trying to decide what will be the value of that copper wire. I'm the output. I'm the driver, determiner of that, uh, of that signal. So we shouldn't be assigning uh, a signal in multiple places, only one place. So if you, and this is very good, because if you realize that you make your doomsday device and you want to get it to work, and then you realize it's not exploding, and then you find this signal, twiddly bit, you know that twiddly bit is not becoming zero or one. You know, in your entire code base, there is one part that drives the twiddly bit. In your entire very low code, there is one place where this, this thing is being assigned. It might be more complex, but that's the part that you have to look to. It's great. 
You don't have to search for it in hundreds of different places. There was a question? This is, you know, this is not a register. This is something we don't know. I mean, I didn't try specially. And normally it's the wire, it's the signal that's going through. It will get connected maybe to multiple things. Some of them could be and, some of them could be or, some of them are inverters. Maybe some of them are flip-flops. I don't know yet. But at this point, I'm just driving it. And since I didn't synthesize it yet, if you want, I don't know if this is a flip-flop, this is a gate, this is a straight assignment. I, I'm, I'm not drawing the rest of it. It's just like it's a hold for whatever could come. In this case, special would be a flip-flop, yeah? Yeah, so this would be this guy, right? So there would be D coming in, would be connected to DQ. This would be clock. What else is there? Nothing, right? Positive edge clock. D special, yes. You are misusing me as a synthesizer. Ah, by the way, you have all access to the labs and tools, right? So soon, I think in the next lab, or already you started writing and compiling Verilog code. You can go and try them. I mean, it doesn't break, you know? You can just compile and see what comes out. I mean, for anything where there's a question, you can just try it out and see if this is correct. Now, the, the uh, slightly annoying part is, um, it's hard job for the synthesizers to read and evaluate code, and not all of them 100% agree on a lot of corner cases. So, you know, normal things obviously will work, but if you're trying to do very creative things and trying to make them fail, well, you know, uh, they might not always uh, agree. Now, here's the funny thing. Why does an always statement memorize? We, I said that you make flip-flops, I said that you can make things like this here. Uh, we didn't really explain why. And uh, now it's important to understand why this is happening. We say that if there is a positive edge of uh, clock, copy D to Q. So this statement describes what happens to signal Q. We don't really say what happens when the clock is not rising, okay? We just described the part when the clock is rising, it should be this. We don't say what happens when the clock is not rising. And um, it, it's just that, I mean, the way it's understood is that because you didn't say what is happening, I'll assume that I'll preserve it. Okay, which is slightly crazy, especially Let's come to this thing, always statement. I have two things, inf and data. If inf result is not data, else result is data. And it's a perfectly valid always statement. This statement describes what happens to signal result here. When inf is one, result is not data. And what happens when inf is not one? Well then it is going to be data. Strange, right? So the circuit is combinational. It doesn't have any memory. I know exactly given uh, what result and data is, I know, uh, sorry, <laughs> given inf and data, I know exactly what result is going to be. This is a combinational circuit definition. I misused the always statement, and I did not forget anything. I covered all the cases, and for all cases of the input, I have defined what the output is going to be. Definition of a combinational circuit, if you remember, and I, I ended up making a combinational circuit. Yes, sorry, question. Whenever something changes in inf and in data, it's not specific to pulse or neck. Anything happens to them, we go through them. Notice that it's not being executed, it's just the compiler understands 
hey, result will be calculated whenever inv and delta changes. So it's trying to figure out, what is this guy saying? What is this circuit, by the way? You could say it's a multiplexer, right? A multiplexer with one input inverted. Yeah? If you said, uh, always have the sentence changes. Yes. Exactly. Yes, but you know, post edge is a function. The function only uh, creates something when it goes from zero to one. I mean, that's, that's how they end up doing it. But it's a very valid question. However, look, there is no reason to, to manipulate these things. There is no reason to play funny games with them. This will be what you want to do. I understand. <laughs> Don't play games with the sensitivity list. There is a lot of circuits that do not have a physical counterpart. Although you could write code, you could simulate it but physically they would not correspond to a real existing circuit. We are using these very log statements, full knowing that in the end, I want to get exactly this character, either this one with reset, with enable, and that's it. For everything else, I'm just going to use combinational circuits. And I'm not trying to make any like magical things where I put 50 different signals and forget one intentionally. I'll not try to make use of that. Yes. Why wouldn't we then have like not like we have gates with like an end gate? Why why can we say end gate now? Because, uh, it's like they have it. I I also don't like that people use the gates. I saw that in the exercises they use it. It's uh, maybe a computer science, electrical engineering thing. I don't know. It's um, the language is purer this way instead of functions. Somehow, I mean, it's um, nice because we are going to use all these blocks a lot for combinational circuits. So if the statements define the signals completely, nothing is memorized. You just have to be careful. Notice that the memorizing happens because we intentionally forget things. Now, the tricky part is when you write code and you actually forget things, Instead of a combinational circuit, you get a sequential circuit, although you did not want it. So it's a bit tricky, and I hate it for that. So why would you use always blocks? Because they have some cute statements that most people like and love. If then else, chase. No while, though, OK? So the trick is. Don't be fooled into this because most if then else are actually multiplexers. Multiplexers are easily defined using ternary operations, which are very simple. There's no danger in using them. Uh, so use always blocks only if it makes your job easier. And I'll show you one. So here somebody is writing this code, always at A, B, cell. If cell result is A, else result is B. That's the practical definition of a multiplexer, you could have written the same thing as assign comp cell AB. Exactly the same thing, there's no difference between them. In one, you type more, you get to write if. If that's your fetish, go ahead. Okay, but sometimes always statements are great. You have these things where you have a data and uh, that data is, you know, could be anything. It's a four bit value. Uh, it could be zero, one, two, three, four, five. Notice four bits written in decimal five. And I want to assign seven bit segments. These are the nice things in your FPGA board that, you know, light up for numbers. And I want to encode them. I have to write down what the seven things are. Look how easy this goes. Always data. If it's zero, segments is this. If it's this, 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 right? And default, if nothing, hey, let's add this to the end. 
that's super, that's nice, that's really super practical. So there are cases where it is not very practical. There are cases where it is super practical. And its experience is a little bit using uh, that will allow you to, um, how shall I say, develop your own style and understand what you want to do and pick the things that are more useful. Yes? Yes, you start with an always block. And now there is also this funny thing. You see there is a star. And uh, I'm going to come that in a slide in a few seconds. That's a, that's a shortcut that says, if anything changes, if any signal changes, look through this. And when you write a combinational circuit, don't put the signals there, just put a star. That's like the safest thing you can do. It says, if any of the signals change that are relevant, just figure out what to do. Whenever you're using a combinational, whenever you're using always for combinational circuit description, make sure that your sensitivity list is star. No, just tired. No, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now we have to use the back slide. Yes. Because any signal assigned inside always has to be defined as rec. That was a requirement. And at the very beginning, and it's a very good observation, I was saying that, uh, OK, sometimes it's a register, but sometimes it's not. So everything that is being defined as rec is, does not have to be a register, but every register has to be defined as a rec. So if you use an always statement to define uh, a, a state holding element, it's rec. If you use an always statement to define combinational circuits, it's still rec, which is why they got rid of it in system analog. Yes? <laughs> Verilog will never really complain. Verilog is this, this very annoying language that doesn't complain. He says, yeah, he wanted it. <laughs> He'll be laughing at your face and doing all sorts of weird things. Now, don't skimp on the defaults, OK? It's not worth it. Whatever you think you're saving, you are not. Because we will argue about it next week that more than half your time, even 90% of your time doing hardware design is verification. Software engineers have never heard of that verification. What is that? I know. Uh, we spend so much of our time trying to figure out what is wrong or making sure that what we wrote is, uh, is correct, uh, that saving these things just makes life more difficult for us. So let's not do it if you want. As I said, you know, if you want to rebel, get a tattoo, you know, paint your hair, toenails, whatever. Uh, don't do this. I mean, it's not worth it. Yes? Good question. Coming in a second. Blocking versus non-blocking. The thing that will, you know, you will have a field day with it. Questions will come left and right, and you will like say, oh my god, why? So here's a summary. Case statement, like if then else, only in uh, blocks. The result is combinational if the output is defined for all cases. You know, that's one of the issues. You might forget some of the cases, and then if you didn't define that case, you're looking and the guy says, maybe I need a memory element there. And uh, for example, in the seven segment display, if you're only going to 10, there's also 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. What shall I do with it? Maybe I need a sequential block. Uh, there, is a, there is a very special case version, case Z, that uh, is able to check for don't cares. We are not talking about it. If you're interested in the book, there are some examples where you can see it. If I say we don't care about it, this means I'm not asking it in the exam. 
Are we okay with this? I think this is like a great thing. I say, it's not in the exam and I, I don't get any questions. So if the question is difficult, I say it's not in the exam. Okay, so let's go with the blocking versus non-blocking statements. This is one of the major pains I have trying to explain this thing. I'm really bad at it. And, um, I, you know, I still have 10 years to teach, so at some point I'll manage it. Non-blocking statements look like this. Uh, you have the smaller than equal and have the assignment. Now, the non-blocking means that the assignment is not made the moment that you write it that way. All assignments will be made once that block is uh, finished in parallel. This is what it means, this is what it implies. Blocking statements, on the other hand, that was a question just a second ago, are a simple equal, and it means that whenever I write A, 2, B, 0, 1, whatever, A actually, before I do the next assignment, has already that, that value. And then B is A, and B will have this value, whereas in the first one, it will not. Now, this looks like something you should care about, right? Who thinks this is very, very important? It's not, okay? <laughs> so this is a, this is a trick about, I'm, I'm, just give me, let me finish this. I'll, I'll take the questions after. Now, remember that if this was a program execution, if you were writing a program that was executing, you are absolutely right. The difference is vital. However, here, we are not executing a program. We are just defining how we are telling the synthesizer, look, my friend, I want to have this, this type of circuit, and I'm going to do this. Uh, if you... So, the first question that anybody would ask is, if it doesn't matter, why do we have it? There are technical reasons, and the reasons are not for describing hardware, but the moment when we are next week describing simulation environments, which are virtual places where we want to order events, where we want to say the input is this, and then we wait, and then the input changes, we want to make such statements, we need blocking statements, okay? I mean, I need in the language the capability to have blocking statements, not for defining hardware, which is what we are talking now, but we need it in general. Uh, Blocking statements, therefore, you know, create this, hey, this is this, then this is this. As long as the sensitivity list is written properly, it will not matter when you are defining hardware. And I'm going to show you an example. Let me go through the example, then we can discuss and answer your questions. Now, the important thing is, you go on the internet, you are going to find counterexamples, I know. But... Uh, the important thing is we are setting the sensitivity list to be star, which is the thing we said when you are doing combinational circuits. Please use this. And I have all these things, P, G, S, C out being assigned. And this is now blocking statements, right? So P gets its value, G gets its value. Now when I come to S, P already has the value C out, G already has, P already has, C in already has, whatever, whatever. Now... The process triggers, all values are updated in order, and at the end, uh, S, this part is going to be one. Okay, there's no surprise there, unless, of course, I made a mistake on the slide, which you will tell me. So, same example, I just changed the assignment types. And now I'm looking through, and you see, oh my God, you say, Frank, look, S is zero. You completely moron. Everything is bad. Uh, the process triggers, all assignments are concurrent. So I make all of them at the very end. And when is S is being assigned, P is still zero. So the result is still zero. Horrible. We are dead. No, we are not. Because you know what happened? The process will trigger again because I started making changes. I assigned this thing. So the process uh, has changed. So P has changed. So it triggers again. Since there's a change in P, process triggers again. This time S is calculated with P1. 
the result is correct after the second iteration. So if I have a combinational circuit, if I'm defining a combinational circuit, given inputs, the output will always evaluate to this thing. If I have these unblocking statements, it might take the simulator, the compiler, whatever, uh, not in real life, but in his way of evaluating it, may take a few iterations until he comes to the same result, but the result will be the same. Now, we will make the arguments that we want to use the, um, let me go first for this thing. We will use always star and blocking assignments to model more complicated combinational logic where always statement is helpful. So if you use always statement for defining combinational logic, using blocking assignments makes the job of the compiler a bit easier because he's not going through many iterations to figure out what you want. He can do it in a you know, single pass, not because it produces something different. So if you accidentally write it with uh, concurrent statements, non-blocking assignments, it won't be different. You won't get a different result. Now, if you go to the internet and look for it, there are very cute examples where things are, you know, go haywire. In most cases, because the uh, sensitivity list has been crafted in a way. And uh, yeah, so don't do that. Okay. So the rules for signal assignment. Use always a postage clock and non-blocking assignments to model synchronous sequential logic, meaning that when you describe this thing, use non-blocking assignments. When you use this thing and this thing and decide that you want to put it in an always statement, use blocking assignments. Also, consider using continuous assignments, assign something to model symbol combinational logic. There is no point in putting an always around it. You know, it's a simple thing anyway. There was a question. Is there the question still? Okay. Yeah? So is blocking statements also like in real life something or it's supposed to work? Like no, uh, it there is there is a real reason why we need blocking statements. There's a very, very real reason. It's just not that relevant here. That relevant in defining hardware. Look, we are, we are, see, we are not making assignments actually nowhere. We are just defining hardware blocks that are connected. So these are gates, transistors, wires. They are there. They don't get assigned. You know, it's not like, ah, oh, let me copy this here. No, I mean, we are defining a circuit that is there. The concept is a bit abstract. I know it's difficult to understand. However, what I want to say is don't worry so much about the um, signal assignment, whether or not it is blocking or unblocking. Try to follow the rules. It makes life easy, simple, and regular. Is that okay? Yes. But it would be interesting in what way physically the circuit is different if you. It won't be different because you are not describing. See, this is a behavioral description. It's just like you go to, to your friend. Uh, the, the situation is the following. You are a designer. You are either too lazy or incapable of designing the circuit as gates. In the end, you want that something like this happens, right? So there's an AND gate. There's an OR gate. The output, this is inverted, goes here, goes through a multiplexer, 0, 1, whatever output comes, another OR gate. Something like this. But to, to, to be able to get to this, which is like a real physical gates connected to each other, you actually have an abstract idea. Well, you know, uh, there is this button. If I press this button and the other button is pressed, if it was red, then let me do this. And either from this abstract idea, you are able to write down the formulas, equations, determine what the gates are, you do this. That's a structural way of doing it. Or you, you find your capable friend, say synthesizer, look, I have this issue. If this, then this, and then else this, this. You describe my problem, says, 
okay, 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 I understand, I understand, like this, this. And out of this, the guy produces exactly this. Or the circuit that you produce is so small, it doesn't really make too much difference. And now you say, you know what, just make it somehow. I mean, either five AND gates or four AND gates. I have a million gates here. And this circuit, this, uh, this tiny part is not what I need, which sags very good into this story. Finite state machines, how do I write them in Verilog? Because this is the exact definition where these descriptions end up being quite complex. Uh, finite state machines for processors, for example, uh, they are the instruction decoders. They read the instruction that came. We are going to see what these are. And you have to make decisions. How, what do I do in this cycle? What does my processor mean? Okay. <laughs> that was also a first. <laughs> That's a binocular? <laughs> well, I was going there. Okay. You're from Botanical Society watching? No, okay. Okay. Uh, in, these, uh, in these circuits, you will realize that there will be a lot of cases, a lot of descriptions, and they are complex. If you were to do this by hand, you will realize that you will spend a lot of time, and you don't really care so much. You just want that it works perfectly. So these are the quintessential part where you say, let me describe it in a behavioral way. Let me explain what I want and let the synthesizer take care of it because this one will be a small circuit. It will not, be, it will not affect the speed, the operation speed. It's just complex operation. Now, remember we have the next state logic, the state holding element and output logic. Is this Moore or Mealy? Who says Moore? The rest lost the point, it's not mealy. Okay, see, it will come in an exam. <laughs> Did I tell you that? <laughs> okay, so now, don't ask me why this is like this, but there is a great state machine. It's a divide by three FSM. So how do I divide by three? Well, I count to one, two, three, and every time I hit three or every time I hit zero, no matter, I mean, it depends on how you see it, I will raise the signal for one time so that I can divide from the clock and come up with this thing. So I start with my definitions and I say, hey, this is my FSM. These are my inputs. I have clock, reset, nothing else. I have an output. Internally, I will have two-bit state and next state and I define some parameters. These are constants, and I'm saying, okay, S0 is 0, 0, S1 is 0, 1, S2 is 1, 0. So we define state and next state as a two-bit rec, because we will be assigning to it in an always statement, and the parameter descriptions are actually optional. It just makes the code reasoning a little bit easier. Now, what did I tell you? We have to make three parts. So let's first do the state holding element, this guy. Well, it's a flip-flop, positive edge, clock, positive edge, reset. Somebody was asking, why aren't we positive? Here, yeah, there you are. So this one, positive, positive, right? Why not? If reset, our default state will be S0. It has to be one of them, right? I chose this, else state should be next state. That is the job of this thing with the difference that I also have a reset here, you know, and when it is reset, I know what should be the value in this flip-flop. I say, hey, whatever corresponds to S0, and S0 I defined here, S0 is 2B00, okay, whatever. And then else, I will move next state to become the state. Simple, and guess what? Every time you write a finite state machine, you are actually going to write only this part of code. That's all you need to do. That's the sequential part of it. Write it in a separate always statement, be done with it. Now, next part, next state calculation. What did we say? Based on the value of state, we determine the value of next state. 
<laughs> there are also inputs sometimes. In this case, in this example, there were no inputs. So this calculate next state just looks at the present state, goes back, does a combinational logic, and prepares the next state. So we look at the state, and now the case statement is great. K state S0, next state is S1. If it's S1, next state is S2. If it's S2, next state is S0. If, and by default, let's assign it to S0. Always have a default, OK? Please. And then the output assignment. Well, my output Q is 1 when state equals to S0. That's it. I could have used an always statement for it. So this is this part that we are doing. I could have used an, you know, more fancy part. I didn't uh, because it's such a simple assignment. I, I said, why do I, I mean, the always statement is not helping me, so let me not do it. So now this is the entire thing. Granted, it's not a great FSM, okay? Uh, however, uh, you know, the book and me, I also need to find something that fits in a slide and is written in a font that's legible. There are already people using binoculars. So, you know, uh, not very good. Now, a word about the examples. So all examples in the slides are one-to-one -one from our book, the older one. So the reason I'm doing this Although I sometimes do not like the ex example so much, what I hated in the previous example was there was no input. I'm trying to explain more melee things. Without input, there's no melee state machine. Uh, but this should help you while studying, because you see the examples here. You may open the book. You will see exactly the same example. You will see the text that accompanies it. Uh, so that should help. There's nothing wrong with the examples. However, if you were doing this for, for uh, like, professionally, I would suggest to do things a bit differently. For example, you are already naming the states. Why don't you name them nicely? Why do you say S0, S1, S2? I mean, horrible names. I mean, if you ask me. Uh, use begin and blocks for the always statements. And use a suffix to distinguish between next and present state of the same signal. In the example, they used longer names. It would be much easier if you stay, said, for example, I mean, they use state, next state, which is still, you know, there is a state in next state, but it would be easier if you can identify this signal is, a, is something that will go into a register. This is the present value, and this is the next value, because this will be a flip-flop, and you realize that state will be stored, is, is going to be stored in a flip-flop. Helps you identify in your code which part comes from the output of a flip-flop, which part defines the input of a flip-flop. And uh, generally, when you scroll through your code, you can easily see these are uh, registered inputs. So if I were to change the code, the changes are all here in blue. Uh, I would have, for example, instead of S0, S1, S2, I would have like init, one, two. So, you know, I, I, I think it makes more sense to say, I mean, have sensible names for those states instead of writing just numbers. Magic or magic, it's the last slide. So what did we learn? We learned basics of defining sequential circuits in Verilog. We talked about always statement. I hope I didn't confuse you too much with the blocking versus non-blocking. I hope. And uh, we discussed about writing FSMs. It's really, I cannot stress this enough, it really helps if you can divide it in here. I know that you will want to write always, start with the if, and then go else, if, case, and you know, then, if, else, then, whatever. Don't do it, just separate it into three parts. Thanks a lot. So next week, we will be talking about the need for verification, we will talk about timing. We will talk about uh, elements for sequential circuits in timing. And then uh, we also have an additional lecture just to give you some more information. Thanks a lot. Have a great weekend. <laughs>